Welcome to Heterodox Out Loud, a podcast that brings you thought-provoking takes on the most pressing issues in higher education. I'm Zach Rausch. COVID-19 misinformation, election fraud claims, hate speech online and on campus. With all these trends, many say traditional arguments for free speech are no longer sustainable. Today's blog is a defense of the values of John Stuart Mill, the most influential English language philosopher of the 19th century. His robust defense of personal liberty and free speech is a subject of debate today. The blog we feature in this episode is called Mill Still Matters Today and was written by Richard Reeves in 2018. Richard is one of the world's foremost scholars on John Stuart Mill and is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. This episode is part of Heterodox Academy's fall theme, Barriers to Knowledge Production. What are the barriers and how do we overcome them? Richard joins me on this episode. The basis for allowing for pluralism of all kinds, including a plurality of opinion and speech, is the idea of each of us being different. That's this idea of individuality. And that we are, the fundamental and deeply utopian idea of liberalism is that you are you, and that each of us is somewhat different. And that means that the materials we need to make a good life will differ. Richard Reeves. More from our conversation in a few minutes. But first, his blog, Mill Still Matters Today, narrated by the author himself. Why John Stuart Mill Still Matters Today. John Stuart Mill was born 215 years ago, but his work is still widely taught, cited, and argued over. Mill scores well on what Goethe dubbed posthumous productivity. Mill's arguments for free speech in On Liberty, in particular, have been hugely influential. Do they still hold in the world of Twitter, bots, and fake news? Mill argued that free speech was essential for the production of knowledge, both for individuals and for societies. For him, the pursuit of truth requires the collation and combination of ideas and propositions, even those, especially those, that seem to be in opposition to each other. Why let a crazy or hateful person speak? There are three main reasons, according to Mill. First, the other person's idea, however controversial it seems today, might turn out to be right. As Mill put it, the opinion may possibly be true. Second, even if our own opinion is largely correct, we hold it more rationally and securely as a result of being challenged. Again, as Mill puts it, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. Third, and in Mill's view, most likely opposing views may each contain a portion of the truth which need to be combined. Mill again Conflicting doctrines share the truth between them. But that was then, and this is now. There is a strong argument that recent advances in communication technology, and especially the rise of social media, have rendered Mill's views obsolete. Zeynep Tufekci argued in Wired magazine the following. Many more of the most noble old ideas about free speech simply don't compute in the age of social media. John Stuart Mill's notion that a marketplace of ideas will elevate the truth is flatly belied by the virality of fake news. And the famous American saying that the best cure for bad speech is more speech, a paraphrase of Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, loses all its meaning when speech is at once mass, but also non-public. How do you respond to what you cannot see? How can you cure the effects of bad speech with more speech when you have no means to target the same audience that received the original message. End of quote. I think Tufekci is drawing attention to a vital ingredient of the classical arguments for free speech, engagement, and suggests that it's simply lacking. She's quite right that Mill's arguments for free speech presuppose that opposing opinions are brought constructively together in what Mill called a collision of ideas. He envisaged a constructive give and take between those with different opinions. But as Tufekci points out, the principal goal of the dominant social media platforms is not to make us engage with each other. It is to make us engage with the right kind of advert. 
Our engagement is secured either by confirming our prejudices in this sense, in what Sean Parker, the first president of Facebook, called a social validation feedback loop, and or by feeding our hunger for vicarious conflict. As Tufekshi points out, humans are a social species equipped with few defenses against the natural world beyond our ability to acquire knowledge and stay in groups that work together. We are particularly susceptible to glimmers of novelty, messages of affirmation and belonging, and messages of outrage toward perceived enemies. These kinds of messages are to human community what salt, sugar, and fat are to the human appetite. End quote. This critique is hugely important. Far from providing a thoughtful agora of intellectual exchange, ad-driven social media platforms provide us with some version of I told you I was right.com or a demolitionist display of intellect along the lines of Ben Shapiro destroys transgenderism and pro-abortion arguments, which has had 3 million views, or Sam Harris simply destroys Christianity, 2.3 million views, or Bill Mayer destroyed again and again by Reza Aslan, 4.7 million views, and so on. Is the answer then, as Tufekshi suggests, to impose stricter regulations on speech or force these companies to change their algorithms? Or is Mill's ideal doomed? I don't think so, in part because Tufekshi, like many others, misstates Mill's position. He never used the term marketplace of ideas, although the phrase is often incorrectly attributed to him. And the market metaphor does not capture his arguments in favour of free speech. Mill acknowledged that there was nothing certain about the process through which the truth would emerge as the winner following an intellectual contest. He knew that bad ideas can hold sway over good ones, often for a very long time. Ideas don't exist somehow apart from social context. More importantly, Mill did not see truth or truth creation this way at all. The marketplace metaphor suggests that idea A competes with idea B. And if idea A is true and idea B is false, then idea A will become dominant. Mill believed instead that most often we share the truth between us. That doesn't mean that we are all equally right, but it does imply that few of us are 100% right while our opponents are 100% wrong. We all gain from exposure to others, exposure to challenge. In million terms, then, the case for free speech lies as much in our capacity to listen as in our willingness to speak. It also requires us not only to accept, but to seek out alternative views, to challenge our own prejudices, and to work hard to try and keep an open mind. Like Tufekshi, Mill worried that new forms of mass media might make this task harder, although in his case, the new technology was the mass printing of newspapers. In his essay, Civilization, Mill wrote, The newspaper carries home the voice of the many to every individual among them. By the newspaper, each learns that others are feeling as he feels. Of course, a Facebook or Twitter feed can be much more finely tuned to our own preferences and views. We learn even more securely than through a chosen newspaper that others are feeling as we feel, because that may be most of what shows up in our feeds. But this is a difference of degree rather than of kind, and the solutions may turn out to be the same as those proposed by Mill. We need to become more discerning consumers of content, better able to sort fake from real news, more attuned to the financial or other motives of the messenger, and more careful about judging expertise. These skills take time to develop, but they probably will develop. As a society, we've only been focused on these problems of fake news and manipulative bots since roughly 2016. We should not rush to censorship as a solution. We should first examine a broad range of responses, including responses that people develop on their own. I've noticed, for example, that my teenage sons are highly adept at evaluating YouTube videos. They know what clickbait is, even if they still choose sometimes to click on it. They look not only at the video, but who posted it, and therefore likely why, how it was edited down for the longer version, and so on. They know that if they want to hear thoughtful arguments for free markets, a good place to start is Milton Friedman's What is America lecture, currently with 100,000 views, rather than a contemporary polemicist. We will all also have to work harder and more intentionally so as not to succumb to the temptations of ideological tribalism. We are likely, I think, to develop more sophisticated notions of social media responsibility, 
And that concept may impose duties on the social media platforms themselves, such as verifying the identity of users, as well as on individual users themselves. Liberals like Mill knew that liberal societies could only flourish if the individuals comprising them did the necessary work of citizenship, which includes the work of self-knowledge, self-improvement, and individual growth. Nobody ever said that liberal democracy was easy. Perhaps it's even harder than we thought. Richard Reeves, Mill Still Matters Today. Richard joins us now. The blog that you wrote, it's called Why Mill Still Matters Today. You wrote the piece about three years ago, and even though in context it's a super brief amount of time, a lot has changed. And I'm wondering, is John Stuart Mill even more relevant now amidst kind of through the COVID pandemic? And you were talking quite a bit about the role of social media and free speech in the blog. Yes. I mean, there's obviously a danger here, Zach, which anybody who spent years writing about an intellectual will always be inclined to say, more relevant today than ever. And I fear I may have even argued that when my book about Mill came out, which was in 2007. And the truth is that it was hard to make that argument then, you know, pre-Great Recession, pre the rise of populism. The truth is that in 2007, liberalism was probably, it was probably at the end of a kind of high point, actually, in, in liberal history. And so it was a more strained argument to make then. But I actually think the argument is less strained now. It's quite clear that the threats to the sort of liberalism and liberal democracy that Mill argued for aren't going away. This wasn't a passing moment. The challenges, and we see internationally, which I think is important, to some of the fundamental ideals that Mill was arguing for back in the 19th century. The populist challenge is not going away. And that was a challenge that Mill had to face back in the 19th century. And secondly, and you just alluded to this, Zach, I think the questions around how do we construct an ecosystem or an environment within which we can bring about what Mill called the collision of ideas in a productive way. How can we ensure that free speech, free engagement of ideas is both protected but also productive? Mill didn't argue for free speech on human rights grounds. Mill actually argued for free speech on much more instrumental grounds, which is it is the only way to make good progress. It's how we progress in knowledge. It's how we progress as a society. And so Mill has a view about free speech, which isn't really about speaking, it's about listening and it's about engaging and it's about collating the opinions of others and so on. And I think the shock we've had to the information ecosystem, I think I'm probably using Jonathan Haidt's language here, and so I should acknowledge it. On Heterodox Academy, I should probably own up to that fact. The shock that social media has created to that and the velocity of information now, I think does pose a, a real challenge to million idealistic ideas about how free speech works in the real world. And I think Mill has an answer, but I do think those questions are being asked with new force. One of the things I thought was really interesting about your blog was you were talking about while Mill was writing his work, it was at the same time of the rise of print newspaper, and that some of the same concerns were arising then as kind of are now as we have the rise of social media and a new technological medium. How different is the context now. You made the argument in the blog that the solutions that he brings forth could still work today. Do you still feel that way? To some extent. I mean, I, I think it's we have to start with you know, a fair recognition that you know, Mill couldn't anticipate Twitter or Reddit or 4chan and so on, or Facebook. And that level of velocity certainly he couldn't have seen. You know, the amplification and acceleration of information that we see in these systems, I think is something that Mill couldn't anticipate. And that does pose a real challenge to the kinds of conversations, dialogues, and interactions that he wanted. But I think it's important to say that it's not as if this stuff comes completely out of the blue for Mill or other liberal thinkers. Sometimes there's this view that Mill and others just thought there was an agora, perfect marketplace, every idea out there and the market will sort it all out. That's absolutely not true. He had a deep understanding that the institutions through which information flows mattered. And as you've just alluded to, Zach, the concern he had at the time was the rise of mass media and mass literacy. And his concern was that the mass media would actually just create mass views, that people would start to think alike. 
and that that would actually create less opportunity for diversity. And he was worried about that in a political context. What he worried about was a mass media and a mass populace thinking all the same thing would elect basically a mass working class party and that that would create a lack of pluralism in politics. He came to believe that proportional representation, a more representative political system, would actually help with that problem. But he was worried about this massification of opinion. I think the difference now is that it's not a unitary thing. It's not like there's a mass and that there is a mass media. What we're seeing is sort of multiple massification, if you like, in social media. So some of those dynamics about people thinking the same as each other and reinforcing their views by, through confirmation bias by hanging out with online or reading the same as other people who share their views. That's true, but I think what Mill didn't anticipate was that it could be lots of that going on. He was worried about a single mass. Now we have to worry about multiple masses. And I think they are masses in the sense that Mill meant. These are groups of people who all believe the same and read the same, think the same, but there's more than one. And so he was worried about a single mass. I think social media has created multiple masses. So how do you demassify social media and break open these masses, I think, is this challenge. And so I think that's a big difference to what Mill was dealing with. But the underlying analysis, I don't think, is as different as some people think. So... In September and October at Heterodox Academy, we're going to be focusing on different barriers to knowledge production. And I think very related to this, one of the most prominent barriers that people talk about today is what's called the epistemic crisis, where there is a fundamental breach in who we trust, how we come to know things, and what we believe we know. Do you agree? The first thing, of course, is that we've all now become much more comfortable with using the term epistemic or epistemology. It's making lots of philosophers really happy, by the way. Um, it's like a term of art now. I mean, if you don't know what an epistemic crisis is, you're not in conversation. So that in and of itself is a sort of rather troubling symptom of where we've got to, that we now throw these words around so easily. But I think this idea of how do we know what we know and who do we trust to know it is fundamental to the challenge that we face right now. I'll give a shout out here to Jonathan Rausch. The conversation between Jonathan Rausch and Jonathan Haidt on this is genuinely one of the unmissable events, I think, in terms of the epistemic crisis. So, and what John Rausch does is he breaks down the institutions of, of knowledge production. And I think in some ways what we're talking about is some of a crisis of authority in the sense of where are the trusted sources? And I would say of truthfulness as much as of truth. In other words, that you believe there's a system, there's a structure, there are norms, which mean that person A is someone I should listen to much more closely than person B. It doesn't mean person A is always right, right? One of the big lessons of Mill's philosophy is that you have to allow person B, who seems crazy now or ill-informed, into the conversation because they might be right, and sometimes they turn out to be. But overall, you have systems of peer review, of checking, of peer pressure and so on, which means that other things equal person A is more likely to be right. And just as importantly, person A is trying to be right. I think in Mill's thinking about knowledge production is the presumption that people are trying to get it right. And that is a very, very important assumption at the heart of his philosophy, because if people are trying to get it right, they come into someone who disagrees with them, they listen to them, they think, oh, well, interesting. But I think this assumption that people are trying to get it right and that people are trying to tell the truth it's something that really has been challenged in recent years. This is a hugely important difference between misinformation and disinformation. We've always had misinformation. Misinformation is good. Right? It's, it's how you find out stuff's wrong and then right, and then you check it, right? Disinformation is something else. That's, there's a deliberateness. There's an intentionality to the falsehood. That's where you switch into propaganda, and that's where I think a very, very different world we're in now. What I think is so interesting here is you're really talking about the kind of like the ethics of speech. And I do also feel like this ties into this other part of your essay that at first I found surprising, which is the vital importance of listening. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to Mill's kind of the ideas of the ethics of free speech, the importance of listening, and then the relationship to free speech. Yeah, I make an important distinction in my mind between an exchange of ideas and an engagement of ideas. And so you can think about an exchange, right? An exchange of ideas could be like an exchange of gunfire, right? Yes, one side is firing ideas across to the other, but they're not intending to help each other or engage with each other. And that's just as simply the idea being fired across the trenches and so on. 
And, and equally, I think if we said to people, okay, you can be free to speak, but only in a forest where no one can possibly hear you without a microphone. Okay, that's one kind of free speech. But I think the point is not about you can say what you want, it's that I can hear what I want. It's about the engagement. And that's why I think this issue of listening has become so much more important. I think a world in which everyone's free to say what they want, but nobody ever listens to them is not the world we're after. And so I'm afraid of, that in the debate about free speech now, it's become a little bit around, I have a right to do this, I'm gonna go onto college campus and speak, et cetera. And really that's not the point. <laughs> the point is to be heard, or at least from a million perspective, that's the point. Because the point of allowing for free speech is to allow for the engagement of ideas and to allow you listen to somebody, and let's say you think 99% of what they've said is complete BS or even offensive, but there's one thing they say, you think, huh, I hadn't thought of it that way. And it slightly revises your opinion on something that person was worth listening to because they've just ever so slightly at the margins um, changed your view. And I love this line from Mill where he says, it's very rarely the case that one person has all the truth and the other has none. It's usually the case that you share the truth between you. He uses this verb collation a lot. And I think collation is a better way of thinking about it than collision. Because if a collision of ideas, one bounces off the other, and it presupposes that one wins and one doesn't. But collation is better, because then it's just this constant sense of I'm updating my views, I'm taking on new evidence, I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about what you've said. And so for me, it's really what's being lost in, here, in this debate is really about the idea of engagement. And I'm afraid that you end up with a sort of First Amendment type right to speak. But if no one's listening, or... If the only people listening, let's come back to your earlier question, Zach, if the only people listening are the ones who already agree with you, then we haven't made much epistemic progress. <laughs> I need the people who don't agree with you to be listening to you so that they might just revise your views and vice versa. And so really the focus on speech, I think, has undervalued the importance of hearing and listening. What is your bottom line and what are the most important ideas you'd want our audience to take from your work and the blog that you wrote for us? The first is to understand the basis for allowing for pluralism of all kinds, including a plurality of opinion and speech, is the idea of each of us being different. That's this idea of individuality and that we are, the fundamental and deeply utopian idea of liberalism is that you are you and each of us is somewhat different. And that means that the materials we need to make a good life will differ. And so you want as much pluralism as possible. You want lots of different ideas, lots of ways of living. Mill talked about experiments of living. And so I think the first thing is to try and remember that these debates about free speech or indeed other kinds of pluralism are not about legal rights. They're not these technical dry amendment <laughs> type issues, they are fundamental to living in a society that gives the space and the resources to each individual to flourish. That's number one. And I think number two would be the thing we've already talked about somewhat, which is to try and reframe the argument about speech as about engagement rather than exchange, as collation rather than a market. I don't like the phrase marketplace of ideas because it presupposes winners and losers and so on. And for me, it commodifies speech somewhat. It turns it into this idea of a contest, right? The best product will win, the best idea will win. And instead, I think to try and see it as this process of engagement. So free listening is just as important and arguably more important than free speech. And there's a danger right now that we are getting into this kind of quite legalistic, technocratic debate about free speech and truth and so on. And I don't want the free speech advocates to get trapped in a sort of technocratic rights-based approach to this and lose what I think is ultimately a rather beautiful idea about individuality and engagement and exchange. And right now, to say that you want a world where people are genuinely engaging with each other and giving each other the space to be who they are and learning from each other makes me sound like a wild-eyed utopia. I'm aware of that. But there's always been a strand of wild-eyed utopia in liberalism. And so we shouldn't be too ashamed of that. And if we lose sight of that North Star, and I think it'll be harder to defend liberalism against the forces currently arrayed against us. Richard Reeves on Heterodox Out Loud. If you enjoyed our episode, join our online event on October 13th, 7 p.m. Eastern. Hyperconnected, knowledge production in the age of social media 
We'll explore the impact of social media on our views of acceptable discourse and even what is taught in higher education. You can find the registration link on our website at heterodoxacademy.org. As always, it's a pleasure to bring our blogs to you. The folks at Davies Content produce this show. I'm Zach Rausch. See you next time.